Hello, BookTube. Deb, of all people, suggested that I do more starter kits. And <laughs> that has always been my intent. I love doing them. Uh, so it was a little nudge in the ribs to get me to get me moving. And I was thinking, you all know from watching this channel that my favorite kind of writing is biography. Uh, and I was, Deb and I were sort of asking each other, well, how could you do a starter kit of biography considering all of human history and whatnot? And, and what would you do anyway? How would you approach it? Uh, and I, I thought that I would break it down by era very broadly, uh, because the key to a starter kit is that it be approachable, that it be doable, that it be short and simple, and that anyone, regardless of how deeply they read into history, can do it. <laughs> Once I realized that that had been hanging me up, it was fairly easy to move forward. So what we're going to do, what I'm going to do, start off, I'm going to do a biography starter kit, uh, but it's going to be multi-part. And this is the first part, and it is antiquity which I am uh, which I am I'm bracketing off as from the beginning of human history to Saint Augustine <laughs> to, to roughly the fifth century AD uh, that's the, the it's an enormous bracket of course but but it's not as intimidating as it seems because the when you're dealing with biography you're dealing with sources you're dealing with something that can scrape together enough factual information for you to actually write a life of someone and despite the huge amount of time we're talking about and despite the large number of very important people who populate that time and whose names are well known actual biographical lives are few and far between even a lot of the ones on this list are sketchy at best <laughs> uh, i just wanted to give you 10 figures uh, and we'll go through them a bit, and make, I'm, I'm making suggestions for where you can start with them. And they are nodes for you to move outward in all directions, depending on what interests you. Uh, and in all cases here, we want to concentrate on a couple of things. First of all, uh, no list, no starter kit list for biography can possibly be unintimidating enough for a raw beginner. If you have never read ancient biography, then no one is going to write a good biography that is actually simple enough. So what you need is something we've mentioned on this channel before. You need to familiarize yourself with the raw, rough, broad outline of the figure in question. So my first piece of advice with anything on this list is go to Wikipedia <laughs> uh, or pull down an encyclopedia off your shelf and read up on, read just a, an 800 page summary of this person's life. That's all. Just to give you a, just to orient you in time and space, give you a rough idea of what you're dealing with here and then move on to the reading material. And then when you get to the reading material, a, a couple of basic questions have to attend any reading that you do in the genre of biography. And the most basic question of all is, what are the sources by which we know any of this? What are the primary sources for this person? <laughs> That's question number one. Question number two is, how does the writer of the biography use those primary sources? And that can be very important, but it doesn't have to be a deal breaker at all, because the third thing is, how do they write? And that uh, covers a lot of ground. That excuses a lot of sins. So, for instance, let's say, just as an example, uh, that you wanted to, you had a, found, encountered a biography of uh, I, the Roman general Agrippa. Uh, and And you knew that he was important, and you wanted to read a biography of him. The first thing you should do, if you were if you were just encounter a biography of Agrippa sitting on a table somewhere, and you want to know if it's any good, the first way to get a kind of sort of feel for the job the author is doing is not to start at the beginning, but to start at the back. Go to the, the author's own citation of his sources and see. Now, you don't have to know anything about General Agrippa to know that all of the primary sources for General Agrippa are going to be in Latin. He was an ancient Roman. You don't know what those primary sources are, probably, but you know at least that if you look at the author's listing of his own cited sources, and they are all Latin in English translation, 
then you know that the author never actually got directly up next to the primary sources. The author only read translations of those sources. Now, plenty of good work can be done that way. Plenty. But it's worth keeping in mind that if there's a problem with a translation, if there's an oddity, the author is not going to know it unless the author's read the original works. So that's uh, uh, thing number two. And then uh, the, the next thing you want to look at when you're studying those cited sources is uh, how many of them vary over time. So you want to see whether or not the author has a handle on the original sources. But you also want to see whether or not the author has a handle on modern scholarship, the field of, of antiquities, the field of classical studies. has It, it leaps forward in its, in its verifiable knowledge by leaps and bounds in terms of archaeological, historiographical, epistemographical, all that sort of evidence comes just sucked in by the great vacuum of research. And it might not yield much in terms of narrative, but you want, ideally, you want your biographer to know about it. So a biographer who's writing a biography of, of Sulla, the, the Roman dictator, uh, who's cited secondary sources stop in the 1970s, well... That's suspect. <laughs> you, if, if the author's writing this in, in, in 2018, you're going to have to wonder, well, why haven't you consulted any scholarly work after that? But the main thing is how it's written, because you can always read something else. <laughs> so so uh, we want, in this list, I, I try in this list to balance things between uh, approachability and scholarly responsibility. And I've come up with 10 people. Now, on this list, there are a whole bunch of names that aren't here. <laughs> and that is because on this list, I have tried to eliminate the, the names from history that are basically mythological. The, the names from history about whom we cannot know anything actually biographical. Uh, and some of those, I mean, some of them are fairly big. Abraham, for instance, Moses. Uh, but also... <laughs> Not not to start any fights here, not to be a brat right out of the gate with this series. I have also left out Jesus Christ. We don't have any independent, verifiable, biographical information about Jesus Christ from his own time period that doesn't ultimately derive from people who worshipped him as a god, <laughs> which means it's not reliable. So I've he's going to be the most glaring omission here. And if that omission bothers you, well... I did a starter kit on the Bible. <laughs> and of course, you will find no stronger advocate anywhere on BookTube than me of picking up the New Testament and reading it. <laughs> Read the New Testament. Absolutely. New Testament apologists, born again Christian fundamentalist apologists, will call the four Gospels biographies. They most certainly are not what we would consider in the modern era biographies. Biographies in the modern era do not contain miracles. Uh, they do not contain God, declaring that the object of the biography is his son. <laughs> they, they do not do anything of the kind. They are religious texts. But, nevertheless, they are the most important texts, you could make a strong argument, that have ever been written in human history. So, again, I strongly advise reading them, and of course I advise reading all sorts of mytho-history. Uh, but I'm going to avoid figures like that. I'm going to stick with people who who hammered out their own coins, built their own roads, have all sorts of disinterested or even hostile records. Uh, and we're gonna, I'm going to try to do with each one uh, something roughly primary, a roughly original source, and then a later source, or a couple of them. So <laughs> there'll, be a, there'll be a bit of a mix. And the first person I want to start with is an Egyptian pharaoh. Now, we know a lot about Egyptian pharaohs, and there are a lot of them who are pivotal. You might think that I'm going to mention Ramses the Great, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to mention Akhenaten, who's an 18th dynasty uh, pharaoh. Uh, he was the son of Amenhotep III, and he was the husband of Nefertiti. He was almost certainly the father of Tutankhamun, and he is widely considered a pivotal figure in, in human history because he tried to transform the Egyptian uh, polytheism into a more concentrated monotheism centered on himself. <laughs> so, so he is a vitally important figure in, in classical antiquity, and he is our starting point. And uh, unfortunately, 
I, it, right out of the gate with our starting point with with Akhenaten, we have uh, it's useless to ascribe something to the primary source category. There are there are no narrative primary sources, and the, the record keeping primary sources cannot be read for pleasure. And that's the whole point of a starter kit is that you can be invited in. So with Akhenaten, I am simply using the recommendation that I'm going to do for him is simply a modern book about him. It's the best one that I've ever read. I've read a lot of them, and I think he's fascinating. I don't think he's quite as fascinating as Egyptologists make him out to be. Uh, but nevertheless, he's fascinating. He has caused, he has prompted a huge shelf of biographies. And the one that I want to recommend is uh, Akhenaten, King of Egypt by Cyril Aldred. I'll, I'll try to remember to leave notes down here for everything. Aldred's prose is crystal clear and... Uh, it's intelligent. He doesn't slow down for you, but it's also really good. It's it's very readable, so it's a good place to start. Uh, and then the second figure is uh, is uh, Themistocles. It was a, a, an ancient Greek hero, an ancient Greek uh, general, who was absolutely pivotal in beating back the advance of the Persian Empire for a time, anyway, and was. Uh, fascinating figure in his own right in, in terms of what of his own culture he considered worth defending and what he didn't and when it comes to to this figure we for primary sources not really primary not even close but still it would usually be considered that and usually in any biography you would you would it would be lumped under primary sources and it's also so good. <laughs> but it's a name that's going to come up many times on this list, so get used to it. And that name is Plutarch, <laughs> the the uh, one of the greatest writers of antiquity, one of my favorite writers of antiquity, who wrote an enormous book of biographies and was, in his own way, far ahead of the standards of his own time, very conscientious about what he was writing about. His, his uh, book is amazing. I don't know why... Plutarch doesn't have a new and glorious translation. Robin Waterfield has done l almost all the lives of Plutarch. Famously, uh, hundreds of years ago, there was a translation done by a group of scholars overseen by John Dryden that is still the most reprinted version of, of Plutarch. But the doing it that way, I mean, granted, Plutarch's book is enormous, but doing it that way, the way that Penguin and Oxford and a whole bunch of other publishers have throughout the centuries, of sort of picking and choosing the really name recognition lives and not using the others does a disservice to Plutarch. He wrote the thing piecemeal like that, but he reworked it for all sorts of internal references, callbacks and echoes that you don't get if you don't read it as a book. So, uh, but I, I'm not recommending that you read all of Plutarch <laughs> for, for this starter kit, but Plutarch did a life of Themistocles and it, it's, very, very readable, no matter what English language translation you use, provided it's from the 20th century or later. And that is a place to start. A great deal of what we know about this person, we know from Plutarch, from not only what he tells us, but from sifting the sources that he had access to that we don't anymore. But there's also a modern book uh, called Rise of, the Empire, of an Empire by Stephen Dando Collins, a very prolific, popular classical writer, uh, whose stuff is uneven, I, I, in my opinion. I have loved some of his books, and other of his books I have thought were dashed off and somewhat silly. <laughs> his book on this person and his time period, the key battles of his life, is really good. Rise of an Empire is really good. So, And also fairly modern, I think it's from the 21st century. So you could certainly find a copy, I would bet, at your library or some, or some bookstore. Uh, then the third figure that we're going to do, <laughs> third figure that we're going to do, is right on the edge of what I mentioned at the beginning of mytho-historiographical -histori figures, of figures that might not have actually lived. I think it's pretty much beyond question that Socrates, our next person, did live. The people who attest to him are are known to us. They are they are not, you know, the pseudonyms Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are not a religious um, school. Of thought at all, so and I, it, I find it hard to. I think I think the scenario that is typically sketched out by ancient historians of this teacher figure who influenced these men who went on to write books of their own is 
extremely believable. So I'm going to include Socrates on this list. And when you talk Socrates, of course you talk Plato, uh, who wrote a vast amount of Socratic dialogues, none of which actually happened, but still, they they convey the man. A great number of them do. They're, they're a far cry from what we would want as an actual biography, but they're must-reading. So the Euthyphro, the Crito, the Symposium, the Apologia, the Last Days of Socrates, these sorts of things that are as much personality portraits as they are philosophical investigations and that are very much worth reading. Uh, so Plato would be our original source for Socrates. Uh, but uh, the... Uh, much later, a, a very recent book that is electrically good, just fantastically written, is by Bettany Hughes, and it's called The Hemlock Cup. And it's the whole era of, of uh, Socrates and the whole story and Plato and Aristotle, and it is amazingly good. If you haven't read it, you are in for such a treat. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave a, a mention of all these things down below, and I also wanted to mention here... Uh, what I I try to remember to mention in every video, I certainly want to mention in every starter kit, which is that if one of these books or even a couple of these books strikes you as yes, that's exactly what the kind of thing that I have wanted to read, but I live in Ox Elbow, Arkansas, and the nearest bookstore is three hundred miles away, and I don't want to I don't want to shop online and get maybe something that's falling apart when it comes to me. I understand all of that, and if that is true, and you want me to look for one of these books. I'd be happy to do that, of course. I would like to think that most of you have been watching this channel for a while, so you already know that, but there, we might have newcomers, and I might not have mentioned it in a while, even for the old hands, so I'd be happy to look for these books for you. I don't know what my success would be, but I come across in the course of my day far more secondhand books than an ordinary person does. So I'd be happy to put that to some use as opposed to filling my own house with books. Uh, but anyway, we're going to go on to the fourth figure now. The fourth figure is one of the biggies. <laughs> this is, of course, Alexander the Great. And when you talk Alexander the Great, there are a whole bunch of sources, not nearly the bounty that we wish we had. Everyone connected with Alexander in any way wrote a book. They all knew that he was a linchpin figure in human history. They all wrote about him, and we have almost nothing. Almost nothing. It's it's heartbreaking. It's enough to make you cry. All of his generals wrote books. All of his subalterns wrote books. All of his friends wrote books. His mother wrote a book. His father wrote a book. <laughs> we don't have anything. Virtually nothing. So you have all sorts of uh, Quintus Curtius Rufus and a whole bunch of other people who whose accounts are valuable. Um, but again, <laughs> in terms of, in terms of readability accessibility, and also a fairly good sifting of the, of the facts and the sources. Again, we're going to go to Plutarch. Plutarch wrote A Life of Alexander. That is wonderful reading. You can flesh it out if you get a modern version, like Modern Library, I think, did a version of Plutarch's Life of Alexander just on its own. But any modern version, Penguin or Oxford or Modern Library or anything like that, the notes will almost certainly include notations of where and when and how Plutarch strays from, adds to, or subtracts from the other roughly primary, a centuries later, ancient histories of Alexander. Almost any English, modern English language translation will sort of inform you along the way of variance between Plutarch and other Alexander historians. So virtually any of them will do, but uh, just picking up his life in general, will give you an outline that will do just fine. <laughs> uh, and then for modern books on Alexander, there are two that I want to recommend. One, of course, is Alexander the Great by Robin Lane Fox. A standard work, brilliant, completely comprehensive soup to nuts. Uh, and also uh, very readable. Robin Lane Fox never wrote an unreadable book. Uh, but it lacks a little bit of poetry, and of course, Alexander is an extremely romantic figure. That's why there are ancient romances about him, almost as many as ancient histories. So, for a slightly more impressionistic view, not inaccurate at all, but slightly more novelistic, I want to recommend a, a, a biography of him by an actual novelist, Mary Reynald, who wrote a book called The Nature of Alexander, which is uh, far more dramatic, far more impressionistic. It's heavily grounded in fact she would have gone at your throat if you had said well 
it's a nice fantasy on Alexander Roth. <laughs> there was nobody in her time who knew the facts better than she did. But her, she, the nature of Alexander, unlike the Robin Lane Fox book, concentrates a little more on telling the story rather than giving you the facts. So th those two together, ideally, considering the, the, you know, the prominence of Alexander in ancient history, two books might not kill you. <laughs> but uh, So I know I'm, I'm straying a little from, from Starter Kit by recommending two books, but I don't think I do that very often on this list. Uh, the, the, uh, the next figure we have is someone who envied Alexander the Great, and uh, that's Julius Caesar, uh, who finally broke the Roman Republic. There, I mean, you had Marius and you had Sulla. You had you had these quasi dictator figures who came along, drenched Rome's streets in blood, strained its constitution, strained its laws, took advantage of the fact that a man could command the personal loyalty of the armed legions, and that why the hell didn't that give him control of the country, control of the laws? You had you had Marius, you had Sulla, you had Pompey the Great, you had these figures who pushed and pulled at the very fiber of Rome's civilian government. And Julius Caesar finally broke it and discarded it. So that it, it, after that became a military dictatorship and that lasted for a long time and that saw a lot of good times and bad times. So I'm not, I'm not at the moment assessing the morality of what he did, but he is a towering figure and, and oceans have been written about him just oceans of stuff so again <laughs> i'm gonna say plutarch you have to read plutarch's life of julius caesar everybody who writes a biography of julius caesar has to do that and if they have to read it you have to read it and if they if they're going to base a large part of their biography on plutarch you should read him anyway not to mention the fact that Plutarch is, as I've said, and will say, I think, one more time in, in the starter kit, Plutarch's terrific to read, even in a creaky translation. He's terrific to read. I don't know where I'd be without him, so I want to recommend him again. But in terms of a more recent book, there are there are quite a few. There's a shelf of really good books on Julius Caesar. Some of them are not. The thing you want to avoid in a life of Julius Caesar is piety. You don't want anybody praising him as as a biographer did famously as the greatest human being, this side of Jesus Christ. You don't want anything like that. Jesus, Julius Caesar was uh, a hypocrite. He was a lech. He was a moocher. He was uh, a liar. He, he was an egomaniac. He was, he was a million horrible things, in addition to being outstanding in a lot of other ways so uh, and all of the stuff that he built about himself he of course wrote enormously about himself in his own lifetime one of the only figures from antiquity who did that that whose whose books we still have uh over and over again in the books that he wrote about himself referring to himself in the third person always he tacitly praises himself his sagacity his his military genius his his mercy above all all of those things are untrue you only have to study his his uh, sources who aren't Julius Caesar to see that he was gilding the lily on all that. But nevertheless, uh, even though you can't take an egomaniac's word about himself, <laughs> no allusions to the to 2018. Even though you can't take an egomaniac's word about himself, you still I still would advise. I have three things here for Julius Caesar. One is Plutarch. Plutarch's Life of Julius Caesar will take you an hour to read. Uh, the other is a new book that will be in your libraries and is is astonishing. It's the landmark Julius Caesar, which contains all of the books that he wrote under his own name uh, and a lot of essays and a great deal of maps. Uh, just it, if, if Julius Caesar is the figure on this list who really interests you, then you can't do without the landmark Julius Caesar. And it's an incredible book. Uh, but the last book I want to mention to him, there's only three. The last one I want to do is a modern biography. So you have Julius Caesar writing about himself. You have Plutarch writing about Julius Caesar. And then there's a modern biography, The Education of Julius Caesar by Arthur Kahn, which came out oh, years and years, 30 years ago. And it's brilliant. It's tremendously readable, tremendously involving, really does a good job of putting the issues that swirl around Julius Caesar into clear focus. Uh, and then it went out of print, and it was it was brought back into print by a, a print-on-demand paperback house. Um, Twenty years later, so you if you if you were to if you were to be shopping for it online, for instance, you will see both a hardcover edition and 
a cheap paperback that came out. Um, it's, I think, now completely out of print. And that's a shame because it's tremendously good. So again, I repeat, if it's the book you really want, I will do my best to find you a copy. I do see copies, not often, but still. Uh, and then uh, from Julius Caesar, we move on <laughs> to uh, um, figure intimately connected with him, and that is Cleopatra, <laughs> uh, who was a queen of Egypt and one of the last territorial holdouts, one of the last independent kingdoms to be a territorial holdout to the ever-increasing imperial grasp of Rome, uh, which she did by a mixture of personal magnetism and very canny political insights. So the, the personal magnetism always takes precedence because she was Julius Caesar's, she was rumored to be his lover, rumored to be the lover of Mark Antony, his, his right-hand man and general. Uh, of course, the personal element always takes precedent, but the thing you want to remember about Cleopatra is that in addition to whatever happened between her and those two Roman men, there was also political survival, not only in the snake pit of her own kingdom, which was no small thing, but also uh, vying toe-to-toe -to -toe with Rome for years. Uh, so she is a legitimately remarkable figure. And uh, when it comes to a primary source, unfortunately, we have almost nothing. Uh, the primary source that I'm going to recommend to you is, <laughs> say it with me now, Plutarch. <laughs> now, you will already encounter uh Queen Cleopatra in Plutarch's life of Julius Caesar. He knows a good story when he sees one and a lot has a lot of fun with, with that aspect of Julius Caesar's life. But another life of his that I want you to read before Cleopatra is his life of Mark Antony. Uh, so those two for primary sources. And then the modern source, a modern book that retells the story of Cleopatra, I've mentioned it on this channel, it's also been praised all over BookTube and all over the book world, and justly so. It is incredible. It is Cleopatra by Stacey Schiff. Uh, just a, a modern biography of Cleopatra, but written so beautifully that, oh, <laughs> if, if, like me, you read with a pencil in hand underlining stuff that's really well done, you're going to underline huge chunks of it. Uh, so that, that does uh, Cleopatra, and that is our sixth entry. This is going to be a bit of a video. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll try and double the pace here. Uh, 7, 8, 9, and 10 leap forward centuries. So we're not, uh, we're not going to talk about you know, pivotal Roman emperors like Trajan or Hadrian we're not, or Nero. We're not going to talk about anybody about that. We're going to leap forward after Cleopatra to Constantine the Great, uh, who put Christianity on the world stage, who gave it a, in, at one stroke the power to change the world, and it did. Uh, and he himself is fascinating in his own right. That of, that decision would put him on this list anyway, all by itself. The, there are a few more fateful single decisions in the history of the world than that. But he also has a fascinating life on his own, and unfortunately, the primary sources for his life are a nightmare of unreadability. <laughs> this is why none of them are known. Some of you will have heard the name Plutarch. Anyway, Tacitus, Livy, Suetonius, you'll have heard these names anyway regardless of Julius Caesar, because they're already known. The the primary sources for Constantine, I'd be willing to bet there's not one in a hundred of you who could name even one of them, and that, there's a good reason for that. Because most of them have no popular translations, and most of them are unreadable. So uh, with Constantine the Great, I want to move forward to and give you just one recommendation. It's a modern book, and it is a study of Constantine seen through the light of the only one of his relatively contemporary biographers or writers or chroniclers who is readable, and that's Eusebius. And the book is called Constantine and Eusebius. It's by Timothy Barnes. And it will give you the whole world of Constantine and the whole significance of it. And also, crucially, as you can tell from the title, it will take you through that significance uh, through the lens of how we know what we know. With Constantine, it's, it's kind of important how we know what we know, and this Barnes does a great job of that. Think Constantine and Eusebius is out of print. Sorry about that. Your library might have a copy especially if access to a new university library. Um, then we move on to number eight, and that is a figure I've mentioned on this channel before, a figure without whom I could not do, and that is St. Augustine, uh, who not only gives us a clear, great view of the, the Christianity of his day, but also changes the game as far as biographies go. So if you know even if you're if you're interested in him as a figure of significance in history, fine, you've got plenty to deal with. But if you're interested in him as a figure in the significance of my favorite genre, 
he's absolutely pivotal. Augustine's Confessions is absolutely pivotal. It's a book that has no precise antecedent in in the writing that survives from uh, the ancient world and is amazingly good to read. <laughs> it reads like it was written yesterday. Uh, so with St. Augustine, I want to recommend the Confessions. I want to recommend that you read the Confessions of St. Augustine. Uh, and a really good modern translation is by Sarah Rudin. She did a fantastic job. And it's a recent book. It was just last year or the year before that. So it should be in your library and in your bookstore, in paperback, for instance. Uh, uh, but I also wanted to recommend a biography of him. And it's a fairly old one. Uh, and it, it's still really readable. It's Augustine of Hippo by Peter Brown, the, widely regarded as the standard biography. So, so that if, in addition to the Confessions, uh, any good edition of the Confessions will give you, as its introduction, a wonderful biography of, of of St. Augustine, everything that we actually know. If that isn't enough for you, if reading that and then reading the Confessions, which is the man himself living on the page, if that isn't enough for you and you want a biography, Peter Brown would be a great place to go. There are a bunch of other really good books on Augustine, but that's a great place to go. Uh, and then the next person is a Roman emperor, but it's Justinian, centuries after Julius Caesar, uh, who did his best with the help of a supreme general named Belisarius to reconquer lost chunks of the Roman Empire and bring them back under the sway of Constantinople. Uh, but the, for, to my mind, the, Justinian's main strength as, as a, a figure who deserves to be on this list is his legal thought. He, he codified and, and examined the law in a way that no... A uh, figure of comparable power to him had done in centuries, <laughs> uh, and uh, so as a result, uh, w one document I would recommend if you're really into the idea of Justinian would be his Digest of Roman Law. He, he, I believe the Penguin Classics did a, a translation of it. I'm sure that you can find a free translation of it, and it's fascinating to read. You you in the 21st century you'll look at it, and your first instinct would be, uh, well, yeah, of course, a lot of this is absolutely basic it's commonplace but it wasn't <laughs> so it's it's fascinating to read but in terms of biography in terms of reading about justinian there's a figure from his from his own time a figure well known to him procopius was a historian in justinian's day he was attached to general belisarius he was writing he wrote official documents about justinian's buildings and civic reforms and all that he also wrote official histories of the campaigns of Belisarius, and they are everything that you would think in, they would be in terms of official documents. They are meant to be read in bookstores. They were meant to be bestsellers. They were certainly meant to be read by their subjects. And the whole time that he was doing that, he was also writing a book, The Secret History, full of scandal and gossip and innuendo and vituperation, a, an immediately readable book. So when it comes to Justinian, I want to recommend The Secret History. Now, keep in mind, read it with a pinch of salt. When Justinian says that many people walking down the street would look up in the high windows of Justinian's palace and see the windows blazing with light or hear him talking with a demon late, late at night, <laughs> you know, on, bear in mind, Procopius was working out some inner demons when he was writing this book. That's what makes it so fascinating to read. But in terms of a contemporary book, there's a really good one. It's by Avril Cameron. And it's called Procopius and the Sixth Century, when, in which, again, like with uh, Timothy Barnes, we study the time through the writer. And it ends up being very worthwhile to do that. Uh, of course, you get a lot of other things that uh, the author brings in, tons and tons of the age of Procopius. But we, we start with that, and that helps a lot. It, believe it or not, it helps to ground things a lot. So ideally, when you were dealing with Justinian, you would read a bit of his of his law work that isn't necessary you would read the secret history which you're going to love because it's not just justinian it's belisarius it's justinian's wife theodora it's a, it's a belisarius's wife and it's a whole bunch of other side characters including a gigantic marauding whale uh and procopius knows how to tell a story and leaves no great stories out so i recommend reading that it won't take long it's not a long book and then you'll be ready to read a, a a big serious book it's very inviting anyway even though it's very serious about the world that Proco that we know that we know mostly through procopius so, so uh i recommend that and then our tenth and final person is attila the hun <laughs> 
Uh, and Attila the Hunt is a nightmare. He's the one we're going to wrap up with here. And he's a nightmare when it comes to primary sources. He conquered a larger swath of the world, of his of the world of his day, than almost any other conqueror. It's it, And changed things, changed the complacency of the places that he conquered, entered into their DNA elements that allowed them to become nation-states, that allowed later ideas of nationality. He's Attila is incredibly important. Uh, for this time period, he's incredibly important, even though all of his work was destruction. All of his work was nihilistic. Even so, he's a nightmare when it comes to primary sources, <laughs> so I'm not going to recommend any. Instead, I'm gonna, He's also a nightmare when it comes to secondary sources, to modern biographies. No one can agree with every every major biography that comes out of him will have eight people saying it's the best work that's ever been done and two people saying that it's a sacrilege not only to Attila biography but to anything to to life in general <laughs> and that leaves you feeling a bit at odds uh one cure is to read widely if you read widely of the of the books that are out there you can start to judge for yourself which ones fail and which and why and how uh if you don't have time to read widely, if you're not a fan of Attila, or if you want to cover a lot of things on this list, I have two recommendations here, but both of them, both of them have been praised to the skies by scholars who know the subject, and both of them also been damned by scholars who know the subject. So you have to read them a little bit at arm's length, unfortunately. Uh, and the first one is Attila the Hun by John Mann, which has a lot of personal stuff. Uh, John Mann is more of an impressionistic writer than probably I would like. But it's a very approachable way to get into the subject. And he's quite good on Attila. So uh, I recommend him. And also uh, E.A. Thompson. It's a, this is a much older book. E.A. Thompson wrote a book just on the Huns. Of course, there's, there's a huge chunk on Attila. But, uh, his, and his book is more of a survey. Uh, and can occasionally be dry. But does not vary. It does not wander into areas that many scholars have attacked it on. So uh, if if you're interested in the context, I would recommend that. And then man's book for for the man himself. Uh, and that that will do it. This is a hideously long video. Sorry for that. But that is, if we're going to do a biography starter kit, and we're going to do it in, you know, anything even approaching uh, comprehensive, I figured we would break it down by, by time periods. So that is antiquity from thousands of years ago to to you know it's from from the pharaohs of ancient egypt to the doorstep of the middle ages and then if if you like this then we'll do the next one will be a biography starter kit of the middle ages the long middle ages and that we'll slowly get to the present day uh, but anyway i'm going to wrap this up for now uh, and i'll again i'll try to leave everything linked down below or noted so that you can read what i'm talking about uh, and i'll see you soon thank you booktube